This series is sponsored by Brilliant. Brilliant is a personal learning app that allows people of all knowledge levels to jump into learning real math and science with fun, interactive lessons that you can complete in just a few minutes a day. They have thousands of unique lessons in physics, mathematics, computer science, and more, and they add exclusive new content every single month. And the best part is you can get started for free by going to brilliant.org slash forestvalkai or using the link in the description below. And the first 200 people that sign up get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Whether you're interested in advanced topics like relativity or astrophysics or just the fundamentals of scientific thinking, which is a course that I think everybody should take regardless of their knowledge level, Brilliant has something for you. So keep exploring at brilliant.org slash forestvalkai. Get started for free and hurry because the first 200 people get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Thanks so much to Brilliant for sponsoring this series. Now let's learn science. In the last episode, we talked about how we know that evolution is real, but we still haven't talked about how it actually works. We know about DNA and genes and mutations, but how do these pieces come together to make a whole process? How does DNA control the way that an organism survives? How do random mutations build up to complex structures? How exactly does natural selection select? How does old DNA make a new species? And more importantly, what is a species? Today, we're going to answer all those questions and more as we talk about the mechanisms, the patterns, and the effects of evolution. When we talk about pretty much any topic in biology, the word species comes up a lot. It's incredibly important that we're able to distinguish between different species in order to understand big concepts like evolution and ecology. And the fact that the concept of a species is so fundamentally important for almost all understanding in biology makes it that much more surprising that the word species doesn't actually have a concrete definition. In fact, the honest truth is, a species isn't even a real thing. It's just a label that we use to try to categorize life to make it easier to understand. At one point or another, you've probably heard somebody say, if two organisms can't reproduce to produce fertile offspring, then those are two different species. And that is called the biological species concept. But hear that word, concept. Not theory, not law, not rule, concept. And the reason that it has that title is because the biological species concept is fine, but it doesn't always work. For example, what about bacteria? They don't reproduce sexually, so are they all one species or is every single bacteria a different species? What about viruses? They don't reproduce by themselves and they aren't even technically alive, and yet somehow we still have different species of viruses. What about dinosaurs? Those were certainly alive and they certainly reproduced, but how are you gonna test which ones could reproduce to produce fertile offspring? So for these situations, we have completely different species concepts. And in fact, there are a lot of species concepts and not a single one of them works all the time. There's the ecological species concept, which is all about what niches two organisms occupy, whether they're the same or very different. Then there's the phylogenetic species concept, which is all about relationships, and there are several different versions of that based on how you track those relationships. And while all these different species concepts are useful, there isn't a single one of them that's without flaws or exceptions, and so there is no single agreed upon definition of what a species actually is, because again, a species isn't actually a real thing. Remember, life is what life is, and our job as scientists is to try to cram it into boxes in order to make it make sense. And that doesn't always work. So when we talk about speciation, the formation of a new species, we don't mean to say that there was once a monkey and then it gave birth to a human. Evolution is a slow, gradual, almost imperceptible change from generation to generation. So while you could very easily see differences between my skeleton and the skeleton of one of my ancestors from millions of years ago, if you had every single skeleton between them and me all lined up in a row, there isn't a single place where you could definitively say that is now a human and everything before it isn't. To understand this better, take a look at this transition between blue and red. 
Where exactly does the red start? What is the one precise point on this image where it is definitely red and everything else before it is not red? If we look at just two narrow slivers of this image, it's pretty obvious which one is red and which one isn't. We could even make this image a series of bars, and we can still see where the red starts, and we can see the transition, but when we look at the whole actual image, there isn't a single point in this gradient where it went from just blue to just red. It's just not that simple. Here's another example. French comes from Latin, but there was never a time when a parent who only spoke Latin had a child who only spoke French. It was a slow and gradual process over hundreds and hundreds of years, and at no point in that timeline could you pick a single person and say, you are now speaking French and everybody before you spoke Latin. That just wouldn't make any sense. So for the exact same reason that I'm not currently speaking to you using words like thee and thine and thou, there was never a time when a fish gave birth to a monkey or a dinosaur gave birth to a chicken. There are no animals that are half chipmunk, half spider, or two-thirds bird, one-third baboon. And just like French didn't come from Spanish, but they share a Latin root and now exist together at the same time, humans didn't come from chimpanzees. We share a common ancestor, and now we exist together at the same time. The point is, when we're talking about evolution, we're talking about little changes from one generation to the next that build up to eventually become the big changes that you can see by looking back over the fossil record. But of course, these are all mostly metaphors, so what is evolution actually changing? What's doing the work in evolution? That all comes down to alleles. We're going to be talking a lot about alleles today, so let's do a quick recap about what those are. A gene is a stretch of DNA that codes for a particular thing. Different versions of that gene that code for different versions of that particular thing are called alleles. So for example, the genes that code for eye color have alleles for brown and alleles for blue and alleles for green and so on. When we're talking about evolution being a change in the heritable traits of a population, 99% of the time the heritable thing that we're talking about is alleles. And for this reason, you'll often hear biologists use terms like allele frequency when talking about evolution. To understand what this means, let's imagine that there's a population of five animals. Within this population, there are red and blue individuals. To keep things simple, let's say that red and blue coloration is controlled by just one gene. And let's also say that this species is haploid, meaning that it only has one allele for any gene present in their bodies. So in this population, every single individual either has one red allele or one blue allele, and therefore they are either red or blue. Very cut and dry. In this first generation, there are three red individuals and two blue individuals present in the population. If we divide the number of times that any one allele pops up by the number of total possible alleles for that gene within the population, we get the allele frequency. So the frequency of red alleles within the population is 3 over 5, or 0.6. So 60% of the alleles present in the population code for red. Similarly, the frequency of blue alleles within the population is 2 over 5, or 0.4. So 40% of the alleles present code for blue. 60% plus 40% equals 100%, so all the alleles are accounted for. Now let's apply some selection pressure. Selection pressure is a source of differential mortality or fertility, something that causes a difference in which individuals within a population survive or reproduce. Selection pressures can take the form of predators, food sources, diseases, natural disasters, CO2 levels, availability of shelter, or any other thing, living or not, which affects the survival and reproduction of individuals within a particular environment. Simply put, selection pressure means if you do this you die, if you don't do that you die. It's the rules of the game for survival and reproduction. So let's say that in our red and blue population, blue colored individuals attract more mates, or maybe they're just better camouflaged and so they get eaten less often. These would be positive selection pressures. Or maybe the red individuals taste better, or they have a harder time digesting food. These would be negative selection pressures. Either way, the blue individuals are now more likely to survive and reproduce and make more blue offspring. And looking ahead several generations, we see now that there are four blue individuals and only one red one. This means that the frequency of red alleles within the population is now 1 over 5, or 0.2. Just 20% of the alleles code for red. And the frequency of blue alleles within the population is 4 over 5, or 0.8. 80% of the alleles present in the population code for blue. 
20% plus 80% is 100%, so all the alleles are accounted for. Did you see what happened there? The allele frequency, the rate at which certain alleles pop up in the population, the combined heritable traits of the entire population changed across multiple generations, and that is the definition of evolution. Now let's make this situation a little bit more realistic. More often than not, animals aren't haploid. They don't have just one copy of their genome. Usually, animals are diploid. They have two copies of their genome, one from each parent. This means that the animals in our population didn't just have one single red or blue allele. They had two alleles, one from each parent, either one of which could have been either red or blue. Let's say that blue alleles are recessive. That means that both of the alleles that an animal has have to code for blue in order for the animal to actually be blue. And let's say that red alleles are dominant. That means that if even one of the two alleles that an animal has codes for red, then the animal will be red. Now let's look back at our original population. Three red, two blue. Earlier, we were able to do some simple math to figure out what percentage of the population was each color, and we're going to start the same way here. Once again, we divide the number of individuals of each color by the total population to come up with a percentage. 3 divided by 5 equals 0 0.6, 2 divided by 5 equals 0 0.4, 0 0.6 plus 0 0.4 equals 1, or that is to say 60% plus 40% equals 100%. But while these numbers still represent the physical characteristics or phenotypes of these individuals, they don't necessarily represent the genetic characteristics or the genotypes anymore. Because remember, each one of these individuals has two alleles, and one of those alleles may not be expressed. So unlike before, we can't say that all the alleles are accounted for yet. In order to do that, we need to make the math a little bit more fun. All of the red alleles plus all of the blue alleles equals 100%, right? But each individual has two alleles now. So we're going to square this whole equation. Now this formula reads, all the individuals with two red alleles plus all of the individuals with one red allele and one blue allele plus all of the individuals with two blue alleles equals 100%. We know that blue alleles are recessive, meaning that if an individual is blue, it must have two blue alleles. Two out of five animals are blue. Two over five equals 0 0.4, so we can plug that number in for B squared. And from here, it's just a logic puzzle. If B squared equals 0 0.4, then we can take the square root of that and find that B equals 0 0.63. Our original equation was that R plus B equals 1, so if B equals 0 0.63, then R must equal 0 0.37. Square that, and we find the next part of our population's total genome, 14% of them have two red alleles. Finally, we can figure out how many have one red and one blue allele by subtracting the ones with two red and two blue from the total group. 1 minus 0 0.14 minus 0 0.4 equals 0 0.46. And there you have it. 14% of the population is homozygous dominant. They have two dominant red alleles. 40% of the population is homozygous recessive. They have two recessive blue alleles. And 46% of the population is heterozygous. They have one red allele and one blue allele, so they still look red. We just use logic and algebra to calculate the DNA of an entire population. How flippin' cool is that? And sometimes, alleles aren't as simple as just being dominant or recessive. Sometimes, alleles show incomplete dominance, meaning that they both express themselves sort of recessively, and so you end up with a totally new form of expression. And other times, alleles show co-dominance, meaning that they both express sort of dominantly, so you see both dominant traits together. And while animals like you and I are diploid, having two copies of our genome, there are some animals that are tetraploid, having four copies of their genome. There are even some species that are hexaploid, having six copies, or octoploid, having eight whole copies of their genomes. Imagine how much room there is for variation within those species. But it's crucial to remember that regardless of the alleles present, it is the phenotype, the physical characteristics of an organism, that actually matter for evolution. The genotype, your genetic makeup, causes your phenotype to come out, but at the end of the day, the phenotype is what experiences selection pressure. So even in our red individuals, they could have had one blue allele, but if they were red, they experienced the selection pressure of being red. So while we talk a lot about allele frequency, don't forget that evolution changes the genotype by acting on the phenotype.
It's also important to remember that alleles are always moving around within a population. Even if there isn't a particular reason why one is any better than the other, every single time there's reproduction, every single time genes are combined and passed on to offspring, those alleles are getting shuffled around a little bit. We call this process genetic drift, just random changes in the genetic composition of a population, and that too can lead to evolution. Think of the alleles like playing cards. Through completely random mixing and distribution, new combinations pop up all the time. And even though we're talking about the same old cards, there are some combinations that are better than others. Similarly, even though we're still working with the same old alleles, sometimes new combinations are beneficial. And because evolution acts on phenotype, not genotype, genetic drift can cause certain alleles to be lost from the population if they aren't beneficial often enough. Then there's gene flow, which is slightly different. Whereas genetic drift is one population breeding amongst themselves, gene flow is when two different populations begin breeding together, sharing alleles back and forth amongst each other and adding new possibilities to each other's gene pools. But for all this talk of the slow motion of genes and selection pressures being applied over multiple generations, there are some things that can rapidly speed up the process of evolution. Let's say that I had a bottle full of all different colors of marbles, and then I quickly shook that bottle upside down for a moment, and just a few marbles fell out. These marbles don't represent the original diversity within the bottle, so when they reproduce, you know, like marbles do, the resulting population is going to show a very limited level of diversity. We call this a bottleneck event, and we see it out in nature when a population experiences a devastating disturbance. Overhunting, disease, drought, famine, meteor strike, you name it. Something happens that severely reduces the number of individuals within a population, and the few that are left and get to reproduce now show limited genetic diversity. And it's pretty easy to see how something like that can significantly alter the evolutionary trajectory of an entire species. And there's another effect that's very similar to this called the founding effect. This is when a small population gets broken off from the rest and now has to start a totally new population all on their own, like the lizards of Podmakaru from the last episode. In the end, the result is kind of the same with severely reduced genetic diversity, but now you've also got to factor in new opportunities, new threats, new predators, new resources, totally new selection pressures in a new environment. Sometimes competing species adapt to use the same environment in specific specialized ways, a process that we call niche partitioning. And sometimes there's lots of different ways for the same kind of organism to use the same environment, and so one group will diversify to fill several different niches, a process that we call adaptive radiation. In any case, the story is always the same. If an individual organism is able to meet the requirement of its environment, then it will survive and reproduce, and pass on the alleles that allowed it to do so. And if it can't, then it won't, and all of those individual reproduction rates add up to change the allele frequency of the entire population over the course of multiple generations. Individuals do not evolve. Populations evolve. But it's the individual reproduction that drives the evolution of the population. So what would a change in allele frequency actually look like? What are some real patterns that we can see in evolution? Well, there are a few options. Let's say that we have a population of field mice with a range of fur colors from dark to light. We can draw a graph showing that the majority of the mice have a pretty middle of the road fur color, while a few individuals have a very dark or a very light fur color. This standard distribution shows the natural variation within the species. Now let's add some selection pressure. Let's say that these mice are living in a dark wooded area. The few mice with extremely dark coats have a serious advantage here whereas the lighter mice are easier to spot by predators. This means that the lighter mice are going to die off, and they won't be passing on the alleles for light fur, whereas the darker mice are going to survive and reproduce, and make lots more mice who carry the alleles for dark fur. Over the course of a few generations, we're going to see our graph start to slide to one side, as more and more mice are born with dark coats. This is called directional selection. Now let's hit the reset button, and put our mice out in an open grassy field. Now the light brown mice are going to blend into the grass quite nicely, whereas the super light and the super dark mice will be easy to spot. In this case, we can expect to see our graph get taller and skinnier as more and more mice are born with medium coats and both extremes die off. We call this stabilizing selection. 
Now let's hit reset again, and this time, we'll throw our mice out into a snowy mountain with lots of dark, rocky areas. Super light mice blend into the snow, and super dark mice blend into the rocks, and it's now the medium mice that are at a disadvantage. In this case, we would expect to see our graph collapse in on itself, as both extremes become more and more frequent, and the middle ground between them dies off. This is called disruptive selection, and it can eventually lead to one species splitting into two. These are things that you can see happening in your day-to-day -day life. Think about this. You get sick with a bacterial infection, so you take some antibiotics to treat it. Now, some bacteria are more resistant, and some are less resistant to those antibiotics, so you can't just take one pill. You take a whole regimen of antibiotics over the course of, say, a week. Towards the end of the week, you're already feeling pretty good because most of these bacteria are dead, so you stop taking the antibiotics. And now, only the strongest, toughest, meanest bacteria that survived almost an entire week of antibiotics are able to reproduce, and you get much sicker. Pop quiz! What just happened? You just caused a bottleneck event, which led to directional selection in the bacteria population. You caused a more dangerous strain of bacteria to evolve, and that's why you always finish your antibiotics. Another thing you can notice is that pretty much every example I've given so far has been about one population in one location. So if they were to form a new species, that would be what's called sympatric or same country speciation. However, if I were to divide that population up and put them into two different locations with different selection pressures, then as they form new species, that would be called allopatric or different country speciation. And because everything in biology is fuzzy and weird and comes with a million exceptions, there's also parapatric speciation, which is when the two populations aren't completely isolated and there's still a little bit of gene flow going on in there and so you end up with this intermittent hybridization situation. It's all just so cool, dude. Now let's look at a different kind of selection. Let's say that you have a species that reproduces sexually. So you have males and females roaming around together in a population. The ratio of males and females that are available for mating at any given time is called the operational sex ratio, which sounds like something that you would hear from a guy with a half unbuttoned shirt on some pickup artist channel. So if that operational sex ratio is biased one way or the other, you're gonna have sexual competition. If there are way more males than females, then those males are going to be competing with each other in order to get the chance to reproduce with the few females that are there. This leads to what's called sexual selection. Remember, selection pressure is all about survival and reproduction, so if I can kill you before you find a mate, or steal your mate away from you with flashy displays, my genes get passed on and yours do not, leading the evolution of the population. Now, sexual selection can look one of two ways. It can be intrasexual, meaning that the sex with more individuals is fighting amongst themselves for access to the sex with less individuals, like elk or leshway that fight with their antlers. Or it can be intersexual, meaning that the sex with less individuals pick and choose from the sex with more individuals, like spiders or birds that select the mate that put on the best courtship display. There's even an extreme form of intersexual behavior called lecking, where all the males of a population will gather together in one spot and all put on their best courtship ritual at the same time, and the females literally just shop around like they're at the supermarket to pick the guy that they want to take home. Sexual selection can produce some fantastic creatures, the most common example being peacocks. There's no way that that plumage helps him to avoid predators, or to catch prey, or to fly better, or anything else that we would consider adaptive. It's all just about attracting a mate. The sexiest peacock gets to reproduce, and then those are the alleles that spread throughout the population. Before we move on, it's also important to point out that just like the concept of species, the concept of biological sex is necessarily pretty fuzzy, and it isn't always easy to fit everything into discrete categories. Just remember, just because we can cram things into boxes, doesn't mean those boxes actually exist. The main focus of everything that we've talked about thus far has been adaptation. Now, adaptation is sometimes a pretty tricky vocab word because it can be used as both a noun and a verb. Adaptation is the process by which new traits develop, and it's also a way to describe those new traits, which is why sometimes you'll hear it used interchangeably with words like trait, or characteristic, or even evolution. So for example, you could say that polar bears adapted for life in the cold by developing black skin. 
And you could also say that the process of developing black skin is adaptation. And you could also say that the black skin is an adaptation for life in the cold. Any one of those sentences works. So how exactly does the process of adaptation function? For all this talk of alleles moving around and little changes over multiple generations, how do the big changes actually get made? I mean, it's easy enough to say that having legs is better than having no legs, but how? How do legs actually evolve? This is an example of a complex adaptation, a trait that isn't as simple as, say, a slight change in pigmentation, but is instead comprised of several different components which are controlled by several different genes, all acting in tandem. The genes that are involved in a complex adaptation can roughly be divided into two groups. The genes that actually code for the proteins that physically make up the adaptation, and the genes that control those other genes through what's called a regulatory network. Regulatory networks and the genetic cascades that they're involved in can get pretty complicated, and there's honestly no real reason for me to get into a tremendous amount of detail about them right now. It would be like explaining how every single part of a computer works in order to tell you how to click play on this video. However, it is important that you understand them a little bit, so here's just the basics. So in a typical regulatory network, you have a sequence of DNA called a promoter, which is where a molecule called RNA polymerase binds to begin the process of transcription. Near the promoter, there are other DNA sequences called silencers or enhancers, which is where other molecules called repressors or transcription factors bind to either stop or amplify the transcription of the gene. And on top of all of this, there are a number of different chemical or environmental factors which can trigger long sequences of genetic events. Putting it all together, it looks something like this. Things usually start with an extrasomatic stimuli, some sort of stimulation from outside of the cell or even outside of the body, which triggers the expression of a gene which produces a transcription factor which binds to the cis-acting regulatory element of another gene. Cis-acting factors only affect gene expression on the same chromosomal allele. In another set of circumstances, this could trigger a trans-acting factor, which can act equally on both alleles. Eventually, you get to a normal protein coding gene, which could be the end of the story, or it could not be, because that protein might not be a simple structural protein with a single observable effect. It could be a signal to another part of the cell, or even another cell entirely, now acting as a new stimulus for a totally different genetic cascade. There are also what we call promiscuous proteins, which are proteins that don't have just one single function, but can instead do several things and catalyze several different reactions. So even if it is a one gene, one protein situation, that doesn't necessarily mean that there will only be one effect. A great example of the hierarchical nature of these gene regulatory networks, with certain genes controlling the expression of certain other genes, are what we call Hox genes, which control the general body plan of an animal. Hox genes tell an embryo what parts of the body to grow where. Think about this. Every cell in a fly larva has the exact same DNA, but certain Hox genes only allow certain parts of that DNA to be expressed in certain parts of the larva. Let's look at two genes in particular, distalis and homothorax, which control the production of antenna and legs. Hox genes in the head don't act on these genes, so both distalis and homothorax are expressed, which produces antennae. In the thorax, Hox genes suppress the expression of homothorax, and so with only distalis being expressed, legs grow. Meanwhile, in the abdomen, Hox genes suppress the expression of both distalis and homothorax, and so no appendages grow, which is why flies don't have legs or antennae in their abdomen. And yes, in genetics labs, we can tinker on these Hox genes and make flies with legs growing out of their faces and all sorts of other crazy things. And whether we're talking about flies or field mice, although they're separated by 600 million years of evolution, the same Hox genes in the same gene cluster control the development of their bodies in largely the same way, although mice are a little bit more complicated than flies. And this is because they share a common ancestor who had those same Hox genes. This is a deep homology like we talked about in the last episode. These genetic cascades can be remarkably intricate dances between genes and proteins in response to relatively unremarkable stimuli. And with so many different pieces, there's a huge amount of room for mutation and change. 
any little bit of which can have massive ramifications down the line. As we talked about in episode 2, there's a lot of different ways for mutations to occur. And as we talked about in episode 1, some genes are pleiotropic, meaning they don't just have one single function with one single outcome. So when we talk about these complex adaptations, it's not as simple as just saying there was a mutation on the gene for legs and so the legs got longer. These genetic hierarchies control where a limb grows and how it grows and what it looks like and if it grows at all. It's also a common misconception when talking about complex adaptations to think that the entirety of a trait has to appear all at once for it to be effective. Mosaic evolution is the term for when different parts of the body evolve at different rates or even at different times to all produce the same unified effect, like different pieces of a mosaic of different sizes and shapes all coming together to produce the same picture. A great example of this is bipedal walking in humans, where you have the different shapes of our skulls and our spines and our hips and our knees and our feet all occurring at different rates over the course of millions of years to have the combined effect that we see today. So now we understand that tiny mutations can have massive ramifications and that complex structures are built upon complex genetic networks, but doesn't this all sound a bit like a just-so story? Wouldn't it be a lot more convincing if the same kind of things evolved more than once to show that it wasn't all just a fluke? Yes, it would be a lot more believable if that happened. Also, that happens a lot. Complex adaptations evolve independently in completely unrelated species all the time. Evolution does repeat itself. Convergent evolution is the term for when two unrelated lineages converge on the same adaptations and evolve the same structures or behaviors independently of one another without sharing a common ancestor with those traits. Just look at Australia versus the rest of the world. Australia has been geographically isolated for 30 million years, and it took pretty much all of the marsupials with it. But even though the animals are very different, the ecological niches and selection pressures are largely the same, which leads to lots of different examples of convergent evolution. Mole, marsupial mole. Mouse, marsupial mouse. Anteater, numbat. Lemur, spotted couscous. Flying squirrel, flying phalanger. Wolf. Thylacine, lion, thylacoileo, which was a marsupial lion, which was the largest carnivorous mammal to ever live in Australia, which thankfully went extinct about 30,000 years ago. And speaking of Australian animals, convergent evolution can even work when the adaptation doesn't actually do the exact same thing, but it's similar enough to seem like it does. Let me explain. This is a blue tongue skink. It's a lizard from Australia that has a bright blue tongue that it wags at predators to scare them away. Why would having a bright blue tongue scare away a predator? Because there are countless other species out there that use bright coloration to signal that they are poisonous. Bright coloration to indicate poison is an adaptation called aposmatism. But blue tongue skinks aren't actually poisonous. They just use their bright coloration to make predators think they are so they converged on the adaptation of bright coloration without actually having the poison to go along with it. By the way, the phenomenon of a harmless species imitating a dangerous species is called Batesian mimicry, and it's one of my favorite things in evolution. Before we wrap things up, there's one more super important thing that you should know, and that's that over the course of this series, pretty much everything that I've talked about has been Neo-Darwinian evolution, which is just the combination of our understandings of natural selection and Mendelian genetics, and that's because that's the most common form of evolution that gets talked about. But I should really point out that there are other dimensions to evolution as well. One of them is epigenetics, where the DNA code itself doesn't change, but the way in which the DNA is expressed changes. So you could have certain traits that are overexpressed or underexpressed between individuals with the exact same DNA. There's also behavioral evolution and the development of instinct, coding behaviors and the propensity to learn them into your DNA. In that same vein is behavioral ecology, the adaptive nature of the behaviors that you express on the ecosystem around you and niche construction, 
changing the environment in which you live, and then adapting to the new selection pressures that you just created. Your microbiome, the bacteria and fungi living on and in your body play an enormous role in your life, your health, your body weight, your ability to digest certain foods, and they can even cause epigenetic changes, which brings in yet another dimension. Your great, great, great grandchildren could be affected by the microbes living in your intestines today. But by far, the biggest factor in almost any discussion about evolution is mutation. But whether we're talking about growing bigger antlers or developing whole new body parts, remember that just because the mutations are random, that does not mean that evolution is. Natural selection is the non-random selection of random mutations. Some mutations are beneficial, and the individuals that bear them will survive to pass on those mutations to their offspring. Some mutations are deleterious, and the individuals that bear them will not survive as long, or have as many offspring, or reproduce at all, and 9 times out of 10 will never even know that those mutations existed. And that brings me to the last and possibly most important part of this entire episode. If you look at evolution as just being a success story, as life being perfect, with every living thing being exactly what it needs to be to fit into its environment and nothing else, you're missing all of the times that life went horribly wrong and what a big part mistakes and catastrophes are to everything's evolutionary story. Evolution is a logical process, but life is not, and our history reflects every bit of messiness and chaos that comes along with just being alive. Evolution is not a ladder. There is no peak and there is no goal. Life has never been and will never be perfect. All that matters is that you're able to meet the requirement of your environment. At least until you can reproduce. That's what evolution's all about. In this episode, we covered genetics, selection, adaptation, speciation, and even other dimensions of evolution. And in the next episode, we'll look at the big picture and see how evolution interconnects all life on Earth. But until then, I'm Forrest Valkai. Thank you so much for watching, liking, commenting, subscribing, and all the other stuff you do here on YouTube. Have an awesome rest of your day, and never stop learning. Bye-bye!